Welcome to AP Biology. We are going to be talking about, in this first lecture, the characteristics of living things. And the reason that we're going to start with that is because biology is the study of life. So we need to have a working definition of what life is in order for us to progress through the year. So um, we are going to break this into five main characteristics of living things. We're actually going to spend a lot of time on just this first characteristic. Depending on the book you look at, you may see how many characteristics of life are there. They may say five, they may say seven. It really just depends on how they're breaking them down. The, it's the same characteristics, but sometimes a book will combine two into the same one or break one characteristic that I'm going to do here into two separate things. So um, just so you're aware, it's not like there's five specific characteristics. It's just I'm sort of dividing it up that way. All right. So the first one is that living things show organization. And what that means is they're not just the sum of their parts, they're more than that. In other words, I can take, for example, um, wheels and a steering wheel and some seats and you know some metal and whatever. I don't actually have a working car. I have to put those things together in a very specific way, in an organized way, in order to have a working car. And the same is true of living things. So we start with the chemical level, you know, the atoms, the molecules, and those form organelles. And when the organelles are working together properly, you get a cell. And then cells can uh, be put together in a particular way to get what are called tissues and etc. Now, I'm going to go through what each of these levels are, so don't worry about writing them down right now. Um, but here's the important thing that, again, they're, put, they're more than just the sum of their parts. It's not just a bunch of stuff. It's put together in a very specific, organized way. And what we get are called emergent properties, just like how a working car is only... Um, existing at the level when the wheels and all those things are put together correctly, life emerges at the, pro at the level of cell. If you have something smaller than a cell, like an organelle, like a mitochondria, that's not alive on its own. An atom, that's not alive on its own. The property of life does not exist uh, until you get to the level of cell, and that's an assembled cell. So this is sort of showing, again, those levels of organization from biggest to smallest, the biggest being the biosphere, which is the entire area of Earth where living things can exist. So that's here. Um, and then we're going to work our way down in ecosystems. So there's many ecosystems in the biosphere. And then there's many communities. Um, and there's many populations. And so these get sort of smaller and smaller, more specific, as you can see. But if we go all the way to the smallest level, so molecules and atoms and the chemical level, those compose organelles, which then put a bunch of organelles together properly. You get cells and, again, etc. So these are our levels. So let's talk about cells because that's the smallest level of actual life. So a cell is the smallest unit of life that can perform all the functions to exist. Now, technically, even though the smallest unit of life is a cell, not every cell can survive on its own. Single-celled organisms have everything they need to live on their own. So a bacterium or a little protist like an amoeba, it has all the parts that it needs to survive on its own, and it doesn't have to rely on other cells to keep it alive. Um, multicellular organisms like us, our cells technically can't survive on their own. A muscle cell on its own will die because we have a division of labor in our cells because we're a multicellular organism that our cells depend on each other. So the muscle cells have a particular job, the fat cells have a job, the nerve cells have a job, epithelial cells have a job, and all these different cell types work together to keep you alive. And that makes us a much more complicated organism than a simple bacteria, but just keep that in mind. Okay, so prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. This comes up all year long. You've got to remember this. Prokaryotic, it technically means like before the nucleus, karyote has to do with the nucleus. So prokaryotic cells, this is our prokaryotic cell up here. Um, bacteria, much, much smaller. No membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria, ribosomes, all those sorts of things. They do have DNA. Notice that prokaryotic cells and our gigantic eukaryotic cell here, both, you see DNA. Um, but in eukaryotic cells, that DNA is contained in a nucleus, and then there's a bunch of other organelles that are going to do all kinds of other jobs. 
Um, but prokaryotic cells still have the DNA. They still have a cell membrane, just like eukaryotic cells. They still technically have cytoplasm, um, and there's a few other things. But that's the main difference. So prokaryotic are going to be your bacteria, small, no nucleus. Eukaryotic are going to be the cells that compose all the other living things besides bacteria. So protists, fungi, plants, animals, all made of eukaryotic cells. Okay, so again, there are single-celled organisms that live on their own. So if it's a single-celled organism, it's not going to have tissues or organs or any of those things. But if we're talking about multicellular organisms like us or plants or mushrooms, you know, um, those things are going to actually have these other levels. So groups of cells working together are make what's called a tissue. So for example, there's muscle tissue which consists of many muscle cells working in a coordinated way. There's nerve tissue. There's um, epithelial tissue, which is like your skin. Organs are groups of tissues working together. So, for example, your heart has a sac around it, the myocardium, which is made out of epithelial tissue. It's got cardiac muscle, muscle tissue. It's got nerves running through it, so nerve tissue. So you've got several different tissues working together in that one organ that's the heart. Now, the heart can't survive on its own either. The heart is part of the circulatory system, which is a bunch of organs working together. So you, or you could say even your cardiovascular system. So you've got your heart, and you've got your blood vessels. You've got, um, again, all those tissues that are in part of that. And then if we put a bunch of these systems together, you know, your circulatory system, uh, your respiratory system, your endocrine system, etc., you get a whole organism. Again, a multicellular organism. So that's uh, levels up to the organism level. Now, most of you learned those freshman year. The ones you're less familiar with, unless you've taken uh, AP Environmental, are going to be the levels above cell. And, I'm sorry, above organism. And you do actually need to know those also. And we're going to actually come full circle. And in the end of the year, our very last chapter, we're actually going to focus on these levels. Um, this is going to be our ecology chapter. So a population is a group of organisms of the same species in an area. So for example, you could have a population of mallard ducks, or a population of bacteria, or just a population of mushrooms. It's a population, it's one, it's a group of organisms, usually we say that they have to be the same species, meaning that they can breed and make offspring together. A community is several populations, pretty much all the living things in an area. So the pond community would consist of all the living things in that area. So that would include the fish, the bacteria, the trees, the plants, the ducks, um, you know, anything else you can think of that would be a living thing in that same area. All those populations combined would make your pond community. And then the ecosystem is basically the community but then add to that the non-living things. So the word abiotic, you put the letter A, biotic means alive, abiotic, non-living. So the ecosystem is the same pond community plus the soil, the water, the minerals, all the non-living things that are contributing. And then the biosphere is the entire, every place on the earth where there's living things. That's your biosphere. So these are the levels above the organism level. So that's uh, organization, a little bit of organization. Now let's talk a little bit about taxonomy. So how do we classify these organisms into groups? So this is based on a system developed by Linnaeus. You should have learned about this also in honors bio. You're not going to be tested on his name. Um, but you should know how it basically works. So domain is our top level. Originally, the biggest level was kingdom. Back when I was in high school, kingdom was the top level. But what happened was, you know, we started off with just a couple of kingdoms, like everything was either a plant or an animal. And then it was like, oh, but wait, there's these other things. So let's break it into plant, animal, and fungus. And then, oh, wait, we got microscopes now. And hey, there's stuff even smaller than that. So let's add protists. And then let's add bacteria. And so we ended up with so many kingdoms that they felt they needed something above that level. And so today we use domain. Most people do not know the do domains by heart. These are the three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. It's actually pretty straightforward. Eukarya are every single one of the kingdoms that include eukaryotic organisms. If it's made of eukaryotic cells, it's going to be in eukarya. So 
archaea and bacteria are actually both um, domains that include only prokaryotic organisms. Bacteria include do, uh, the kingdom eubacteria, which is sort of the bacteria all around you. Archaea, that domain, includes archaebacteria, which translates actually to ancient bacteria. So these have some different characteristics. Their cell walls are different. They tend to be found in like um, kind of weird extreme environments, like swamps and things like that. Um, this is a cladogram. You should have learned how these work also. We're going to learn it again later in the year. Um, but this is sort of showing the relationships. And a lot of scientists show evidence um, or have given evidence that supports that actually the, the uh, domain archaea may be more closely related to uh, eukarya, to the eukaryotes, than uh, bacteria, which is weird because we know that archaea is ancient bacteria. We know that they existed before the other bacteria. So you would think because they seem to be the ones that would have been around first that they would be a more distant relative. But a lot of their metabolic processes are more similar to, um, to eukarya. So um, sometimes they'll classify them this way. It's not important for this chapter to know the classification as far as who's more related. It was just sort of to show how the three are related to one another, just to kind of show you that. Okay, um, now, just to show you the other levels of organization. So we've talked about levels in the sense of, you know, the ecosystem, biosphere, you know, cell tissue organ. But there's also our taxonomy uh, type classification. So just to give you an idea of that, I've chosen three organisms. And we're going to go through really quick um, their levels. Now, do you have to know what domain a leopard belongs to? Well, you probably should know the domain, that one's easy, but like you don't have to know the family or the genus or any of that. So these are the levels of organization. So um, the way that we look at relationships is that the more levels that they have in common with one another, the more closely related they would be. So all three of these organisms are in the domain eukarya, and all three of these organisms are in the kingdom animal. So we're sort of getting more specific as we go down. Next comes our phylum. So they all actually belong to the same phylum as well. So if I added, for example, an oak tree here, it would be in the same domain, but then it would be in the kingdom plant. So it would be less related to these other three. And if I added, say, an earthworm here, that's really sloppy, but if I added an earthworm here, it would be in the same kingdom and the same domain. But then you'd get down here, and it's not in chordata, which are basically your vertebrates. Uh, it's an annelid. It's a completely different domain. So it would be more closely related to us than the oak tree, but not as closely related to, um, to a human as the parrot and the leopard. And then notice what happens when we get to here. Now we get down to the next level, class, so we're getting more specific. And humans and leopards are both mammals, but the bird belongs to the class. Aves are obvious. And um, that has to do with, you know, they have feathers and beaks and hollow bones and all that sort of stuff. We have fur and give milk to our young, etc. And then notice here the leopard and the human split apart here at the order. Now, if we had a chimpanzee here, the chimpanzee would be in the same order as us. So it would be more closely related to us than the leopard. Uh, now, what about the soap? Do you have to know that the family is Felidae for the leopard? No. But you do need to know these levels in order, and you need to know that they go from the most general to the most specific. Um, so one simple way uh, one of my students had come up with a long time ago to remember this is, Dear Kevin, please come over for good spaghetti. Dear Kevin, please come over for good spaghetti. And that gives you domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Remember, again, this is our most general there's only three domains. There's thousands of different species. And to be in the same species, they have to be able to mate and make fertile offspring with each other. OK. Um, scientific names, that is called binomial nomenclature. It's a two-name system. And very simply, it's the genus and the species, typically based on Latin. The genus, first letter capitalized, but not the species. It's either done in italics in a book or if you're going to write it out, you would underline it. And after you list it the first time, like Homo sapiens, 
you can turn it into that first one into an initial. So in our next part of this, we're going to do some examples of, of this.